requirement validation could be done uh, uh, on like um, over two stages. The first one is early validation and the second one is late validation. So for the early validation, we could use um, informal walkthrough, while for the late validation, we can use formal walkthroughs. So the first one we use informal, but this one we can use formal walkthrough and an inspection. So in the early validation, we could, uh, especially if we're doing uh, everything like informal, we can use scenarios and mockups and even working prototypes and we can present the mockups while going through the scenarios. This could be done either using optative scenarios that are commonly used for requirement validation, especially the early validation, or we could use a storyboard that can also be used as well. For the formal walkthrough and an inspection, um, especially done at the late stages of the validation process, this could be conducted by reading a specification document in a certain organized way. At this point, we need to try to find errors, inconsistencies, um, incompleteness, uh, which means uh, we need to find requirements that are missing and um, uh, redundant requirements. So uh, identifying those requirements that are not even needed. This is done using formal walkthrough in an organized way to read the specification document by conducting an inspection and formal uh, walkthrough uh, procedure in the latest stage of validation. Now let's uh, start by the early validation using scenarios and then um, uh, prototypes. And then afterwards, we could talk about the formal validation uh, or the formal walkthrough and inspection. So scenario validation, actually yeah, the scenario validation is used to um, validate scenarios with user uh, given like certain users. This could be done using semi-structured interviews or many like it could even use some other techniques uh, like um, workshops as an example. And the strategies in the scenario validation, uh, the first step you need to read the scenarios very loud together with users. And then the second step, you need to ask if they are if they have anything to add or not. And based on their answers, many questions related to the why questions should be raised. So um, in addition to the scenarios, we could also use um, uh, the storyboards. So storyboards, um, again, it is used in the early um, validation stage. So again, early reaction from the users and uh, in particular could be other stakeholders as well. This mainly, um, uh, this reaction um, um, on the concepts proposed for the product. A couple of uh, knowledge that we could um, extract at this point is to know if um, um, uh, actors um, are identified or not, um, uh, make a recommendation about what happened to those actors and to describe how, how and when it will happen. So this is a kind of explanation to what happened to those actors and even describe how it happens. This is more like you, you explain it in a storyboard fashion. The storyboards are very efficient for projects with innovative or, e or even unknown content. Uh, storyboards are widely used because they are inexpensive, user-friendly, informal, and interactive, easy to create and manage for any changes. What are the main types of storyboards that are used for um, validate early validation for the requirements? Um, there are three main types. The first one is called passive storyboard in which we just tell a story uh, to the user and uh, mainly it consists of pictures, aesthetic screens, reports, or even sample application outputs. Um, the passive story ports really guide the user through the story while at the same time explaining what is happening. The active story board, on the other hand, it automatically describes how the system behaves in a typical scenario of use. Um, it could be presentations like PowerPoint presentation, or it could be animation, or it could be even through simulation. The third type is in um, interactive storyboards. So at this um, uh, type of storyboards, we let the user experience the system itself 
And it is considered as a basic demo or even interactive presentation that is really helpful because it gets more engagement with the user. So if we compare the three types with the, uh, of the storyboards that are commonly used in the early validation of requirements, as we, as we have seen uh, in the previous slide, we do have passive uh, storyboards, active storyboards, or interactive storyboards. So and passive storyboards, we could, it could be either a screen, it could be a picture, it could be a report for the active storyboards. It could be a presentation, it could be animation or simulation for interactive storyboard it could be a demo or it could be interactive presentation. As you can see, the complexity of building each storyboard and the cost of such validation process gets bigger uh, along the way uh, from a passive moving to active or even uh, interactive storyboard before building a story before building a prototype moving from the, um, the scenarios to the storyboards the third uh, early validation technique could be uh, prototyping a software prototype is a partial implementation constructed primarily to enable customers, users, or developers to learn more about a problem or its solution. This is defined by Davis in 1990. A simple definition could be prototyping is the process of building a working model of the system. This is by Agresti in 1986. Approaches to prototype could be a presentation prototype, exploratory prototype, experimental prototype or even evolutionary prototype. For presentation prototypes, they are commonly used for proof of concept, explaining design features and so on. It explains, demonstrate, and even inform, um, then uh, they are uh, thrown away, like a couple of like just thrown away without any, uh, any previous um, complete model, just like a prototype to explain and demonstrate and inform the idea. On the other hand, the Explanatory prototype, they are used to identify the problems. It's not about the proof of concept anymore. It's about identifying the problems and eliciting the needs, clarifying the goals, compare the design options. Uh, for explanatory um, the, uh, uh, prototypes, they are informal and they are unstructured and they are even thrown away. But when we compare it to experimental prototypes, they are experimental prototypes are commonly used to explore not, um, uh, the technical feasibility and the suitability of the technology. This could be also tested. Typically in experimental prototypes, there are no user, no customer involvement. Finally, the evolutionary prototype, mainly sometimes we call it operational prototypes or pilot systems. Um, in this, uh, the, the prototype is an early deliverable. Um, that means it is to be continued or to be uh, continued for improvement. Um, um, at this point, development is seen as a continuous process of adapting to the system. This is the evolutional uh, incremental addition to the given prototype of the system. Uh, this is commonly used, especially for agile development. So let's now talk about um, e, uh, some of those prototypes uh, and the differences between them. I'm gonna focus on the throwaway prototype and the evolving prototype. So the throwaway prototypes, um, they are used frequently to implement a large portion of the functionality. Um, we use them to learn more about the problem or its domain and um, uh, that you could discard them after the design knowledge is actually gained. Um, they are commonly used, used at the early or even the late stages uh, of the validation process. Different approaches in the throwaway prototypes could be either horizontal, it means we only just build one layer, which is a user interface, or just like um, you just build a, prot a prototype that is very simple, very quick, but it doesn't have all the information, so we say the quick and dirty approach. Um, the common advantages of prototype, especially the throwaway prototype, is it's cheap, um, but it uh, also can have some bugs. The learning medium for better conver uh, co uh, convergence, um, it, it helps in early delivery, which will help us in early testing and even uh, achieving less cost. Um, this type of prototypes is, uh, is successful, even if it fails in most of the cases, not all of them. 
However, this uh, throwaway prototype suffers from wasted effort if requirement change rapidly, and um, it is often replaces proper documentation of the requirements, may set customers' expectations too high, and can get dev uh, developed into the final project. On the other hand, the evolving prototypes, uh, it is mainly used to implement a few functions better. So we just select a couple of the functions within the system and our, our task is to, to design or to develop those prototypes to implement these functions in a better way. The purpose of the evolving prototypes is to learn more about the problem and the, its a solution, uh, similar to the throwaway prototypes. And it helps introducing risk by building parts early, not all the entire system, just little parts of the system. The use of the evolving um, prototypes, it is used uh, um, in an incremental way. So we never stop using it. Um, it's uh, evolutionary. So we start to buy a prototype and then incrementally update it. This is different from the throwaway, which is used either at the early stage or the late stage. This one is incrementally used. Different approaches for evolving prototypes could be partial implementation of all layers, which we call it vertical implementation. It is mainly design, designed to be extended and adapted. Um, a good things we know about evolving prototypes is that it supports changing requirements. Also, it returns to last increment if error is found. So you can just go one level backward if an error, an error is encountered. Also, it is cheaper because you are not just throwing the effort away. It's incrementally you enhance what you have developed so far. However, it still suffers from some disadvantages because it can end up with complex unstructured system that is hard to maintain. Early architectural choice may be very poor and the optimal solutions are not guaranteed. Also, it might suffer from a lack of control and direction. So what are the main requirements review types as um, uh, as another way of uh, validating requirements. So we talked about um, scenarios, we talked about storyboards, we talked about prototyping, but we also said that we could have some um, uh, formal inspection or formal walkthrough. So to have a formal inspection or an informal walkthrough, we need some kind of review to be done. So the requirement review types um, are varied. There are different types of reviews with varying degree of formality, similar to the JAD that um, modeling that we talked about before or uh, brainstorming sessions. Requirement reviews are commonly used for uh, verification and even for uh, validation. The main steps that could be um, conducted to um, uh, main types of requirement reviews could be uh, reading just the document or you could review the process by just reading an approval, or you could do a complete walkthrough, or you could do a formal inspection, or you could do a focus inspection. So for reading the document, what you actually need to do in this review process is just a person other than the author of the document should be review, should, should read the document. In reading an approval, um, this is another review uh, type that is used for validating the requirements in which we encourage the reader to be more careful and responsible. Uh, on the other hand, the main focus would be on walkthrough and, and inspections. And inspections could be formal or could be focused. For the walkthrough, they are informal. Normally, they are provided on high-level overview and can be led by an author or expert to educate others on his or her work or expertise. For formal inspections, the type of review uh, a method for validation. It is considered as a very structured and detailed review. Uh, it, it is very good because it defines all the rules for participants and in which preparation is needed. And even the exit conditions are well defined. For formal inspections, we have a commonly used type in software engineering that is used to validate requirements is called the Bagan inspection. On the other hand, a final type of a requirement review could be the focus and inspection in which reviewers, they have roles. Each reviewer look only for a specific type of errors. 
So what are the main problem categories? We might see it in requirements at which we would actually need to provide validation for. We could have uh, uh, unclarified requirements in which the requirements may be poorly expressed or may have accidentally omitted information which has been collected during requirement elicitation. On the other hand, we might have even missing information. Some information is missing from the requirement document. Or another problem in our requirements could be due to requirement conflict. There are in which we do have a significant conflict between requirements. And at this point, one resolution to such a conflict is to get the stakeholder involvement in, in, you know, in a negotiation strategy to solve such conflict. Finally, we might have unrealistic requirement. That means the requirement doesn't appear to be implementable with the technology available or given other constraints on the system. For unrealistic requirements, and a most important criteria is that the stakeholders must be consulted to decide how to make the requirements more realistic. Based on those type of requirements problems, we can clearly see that reviews, walkthrough, and an inspection are a good way to validate those problems. And uh, to, uh, to validate the requirements and identify those problems and provide a solution for it. Uh, in reviews, uh, in most of the cases, we just call it review. Sometimes we call it management review. Uh, example to management review as the preliminary design review, the BDR, or the critical design review, the CDR. They are commonly used to provide confidence that the design is sound. Uh, also, it is attended by management and sponsors like customers or uh, users. And uh, for the walkthrough, it is considered as informal way for um, the developers to have an idea about the requirements if they are validated or not. And they are used by development team to improve the quality of the product. The main focus in walkthrough is on finding defects. Final, the type of the focused um, requirement we talked about it before is the Vagan requirements. So for this type of requirement in particular, um, a process management tool is always recommended. Uh, so for, sorry, not the focus on the foreign inspection, it's for the formal inspection. The Vagan inspection is one type of formal uh, inspection, which is very structured way to, um, to provide detailed review. And uh, a process management tool is always formal. It is used to improve quality of the develop development process in which we collect the defect data uh, uh, in order to analyze the quality of the process. Uh, at the, in the Vagan inspection, we do have written output that is very important for validation in the later stages, especially in the design phase. The major role in the training junior staff and even trans, trans, transferring um, expertise. So these definitions of reviews, walkthroughs, and an inspection are not widely agreed. Like some other terms that you might find, you might find in different literature saying formal inspection or formal uh, technical reviews, where the word formality itself could vary. We might see uh, informal based on um, meeting over coffee or regular team meeting, this informal um, preparation or informal view or informal walkthrough. While we define the word formal by scheduled meetings will lead to formal identification, prepare the participants, define agenda, specific format, and even document output. All of these are uh, forms of formal um, terms that can be used to define uh, formal inspection uh, versus informal walkthrough or informal um, management uh, reviews. So as we talked about reviews, let's now talk about inspection and walkthroughs. So an inspection is a formal evaluation technique in which artifacts are examined in very much detail. This could be done by either an individual or a group other than the, um, the developer or the author to, um, of, this, of these uh, artifacts. This, is mainly, uh, this inspection process is mainly done to detect errors to, uh, or violations um, and any other problems that we may encounter. An inspection is considered to be a formal process. An inspection is mainly initiated by the project team, planned, 
and uh, all, uh, an author is not uh, who is not the presenter. And mainly in inspection, we focus on checklist. On the other hand, for the walkthrough, a uh, um, review process in which a developer leads one or more members of the development team through a segment of an artifact that he or she has written while the other members ask questions and make comments about techniques, style, possible errors, violation of development standards and other problems. Walkthrough are not a complete formal process. They are considered as semi-formal. They are initiated by the author of the artifact and it is considered as quite poorly uh, planned process. Why we need formal inspection? Because formal inspection works well for programming. Uh, for, for application programming, they are considered as uh, more effective um, than testing. Most reviews, uh, reviewed programs run correctly first time. And um, on comparison, uh, 10 to 50 attempts for test and debug approach uh, could be used. Uh, on the other hand, if it's um, uh, on the level of larger projects, not on the application programming, if it's uh, considered as evidence for a large project in which error reduction could be done by a factor of five, if we're gonna use a formal inspection process, also, it achieves improvement in productivity for 10% to 25%. Also, it helps in um, identifying the percentage of error. Um, um, like normally, it could be from 58 to 82% of identification. This is really good with the usage of an inspection. Also, we can see a cost reduction from 50% to 80%, especially if you're going to adopt uh, the inspection method for both the verification and the, val the validation. This also including the cost of the inspection itself. Also, um, one, another benefit of formal inspection is its impact on the staff um, uh, competence, like uh, especially the organizational effects. So for staff competence, um, it increased uh, morals, reduced the turnover or over, and it achieved better estimation and scheduling it also achieved better management recognition of the staff ability. So these benefits also apply to requirement and inspection. So if we look to the formal inspection as a, a process that could apply to any software uh, or, uh, or any artifact for um, requirement and inspection, all of these benefits can also be seen such that many empirical studies investigated variant inspection processes and as a matter of fact, mixes results on the relative benefits of different inspection procedures could be combined to come up with one final decision at the end. So comparing the formal inspection to um, I, um, informal walkthrough, there are some planning strategies that we need to take into account for planning an inspection. For planning and inspection, we need to consider the size, the duration, the output, the scope, the timing, and the purpose. For the size, we need to consider the, the, um, the manpower. We need, uh, if it's uh, doable for the project or not, that's part of the inspection. We need to understand or we need to uh, identify if enough people are considered so that the relevant expertise is actually available or not. In most of the cases, minimum three will be acceptable, a max of seven um, um, if, um, if we have the leader of the team actually is inexperienced. For, um, for uh, to plan uh, for formal inspection, may, we may consider duration as a, a feature of um, investigation. So uh, at this point, uh, it should never be more than two hours. And uh, constant because concentration will decrease if longer. So when you do the inspection, don't try to make it um, more than two hours. The output of the, the formal inspection, um, we should uh, we should plan ahead such that all the reviewers must agree on the result, whether they uh, will accept or they will say all of them they will say rework on the result or all of them will they say re-inspect the results. Uh, 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 one major component in the outputs of the um, inspection process is that all findings should be documented, including summary report, detailed list of issues, and even report on process improvement, such that 
we have information about the consistency, issues, models, and what the, the team would need to coordinate among those components, especially in the future. Another entity that we should consider for planning and inspection is the scope. At this point, you need to focus on the small parts of the documentation and the design, not the entire um, uh, component, not the entire whole thing, which includes the entire system. Timing is very important because you need to examine if, um, if a product, once it, its order has finished, how long it will take. Is it not too soon or uh, it should not be too soon, it should not be too late. Product not ready, if it's, um, um, if it's too soon, that means it's not ready. So you need to find problems. The author has already um, been identified. Uh, it also should not be too late because errors are now very costly to fix. Final planning um, um, component or um, step for inspection is to identify the purpose. You need to remember the biggest gain that would come out from fixing the process. It's very important to collect data to help you not to make the same errors next time. So who are the typical roles in reviews and consequently we might see them in the inspection process? We might have the review leader, the recorder, the reader, the author and other reviewers. The review leader will chair the meeting, ensure the preparation is done, keeps review focused and report the results. The recorder is the individual who keeps tracking of issue raised. The reader will walk th walks the group through the specification piece by piece while the author should actively participate, so, similarly to the reader. We could also have other reviewers and their task would be to find and report any additional issues. So how to choose reviewers? Choose among specialists in reviewing, people from the same team as the author, people invited for a specialist expertise, people with an interest in the product or visitors who have something to contribute. People could be also from other parts of the organization. Keep in mind, some reviewers you should exclude, including anyone responsible for reviewing the author itself. Anyone with known personality clashes with other reviewers. Anyone who is not qualified to contribute, and maybe anyone who is present, who is present, present um, creates a conflict of interest. So to provide a formal inspection, you need to structure it, this formal inspection process. So structuring the inspection would need a checklist, a walkthrough, a round robin, as, as uh, a speed review. In the checklist, you need to use a checklist of all the questions and issues, and review structured by uh, and the review structured by issue on the list. For the walkthrough, in this uh, stage, one person presents the document step by step, and uh, the review is structured by the document provided. For the round robin, each reviewer in turn gets to raise an issue. Review is structured by the review team, so we can see that all checklist walk th uh, walkthrough round robin. All the reviews are structured either by issue on the list or by the documentation provider or even by the review team. Finally, you need to speed review. How, how could we do this? Each reviewer gets three minutes to review a chunk then of the documentation, then passes to the next person. It is really good for assessing the comprehensive action of each of the reviewers and the comprehension, um, the comprehensive information that we might see in the review. What can we see in a requirement review checklist as a major part in structuring the inspection? Uh, we, we consider most of the information are stored on the checklist because they are supported to be developed and maintained as an essential tool for an effective review process. In the review checklist, we might see common problem areas and guide reviewers. Uh, it may include questions on several quality aspects of the documentation, including redundancy, completeness, ambiguity, consistency, organization standards, uh, compliance, and even traceability. There are general checklists, and there are checklists for particular modeling and specification language. Sample of elements in the requirement review checklist could be comprehend, uh, comprehensibility, comprehensibility, in which um, we, we try to come up with a view whether the readers 
uh, can read the document standards and understand what the meaning of each of those requirements or not. And also it may have uh, another redundancy uh, information in which uh, we do have information about unnecessarily repeated requirements in the requirement document. Also, some of the information related to completeness could be um, aggregated based on checking um, if there is any missing information or if there are any information missing for, from the individual requirement descriptors. In addition to this, we might have elements related to ambiguity in which we look into answer the question about the, um, the, uh, the requirement expressed using terms, uh, are they expressed using terms which are actually clear defined or not? Could readers from different backgrounds make different interpretation of the requirement that will raise ambiguity issue? Or consistency uh, in which do the description of different requirements would actually contradict or, or could lead to contradiction are there contradiction between individual requirements and overall system requirement or not? Sample of elements in requirement review uh, checklist as well, including um, the, the uh, redundancy and completeness and ambiguity consistency could be uh, organization. The organization will, uh, will be defined in a document structure such that we need to understand are they actually structured in a sensible way or not? Are the description of the requirement organized um, uh, in a way that are uh, that that are that will relate the requirements to the, uh, the 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 organization or not? Also, we might have some information related to the conform uh, conformance to the standards. At this point, does the requirement document and individual requirements conform to define standards or be violated? Are departures from standards satisfied or not satisfied? And finally, traceability. Are the requirements um, um, unambiguously identified or they are clear? Do they include link <coughs> links um, to other related requirements and to the reasons why these requirements have been included? This is a part of traceability that we should see in the review requirement review checklist that will help in validating the requirements. So the entire process that will align with the review uh, process, including an inspection and a walkthrough, prior to the review, you need to schedule formal reviews into the project planning. You need to train all the reviewers and to ensure all the attendees attend attend prepare in advance. And during the review, you review the product, not the author who has created such a review, such that you keep comments um, constructive try to be professional and even, and try to be task focused. Keep in mind, you should always stick to the agenda. You should limit debate and any other uh, external discussion. You just need to record issues for later discussions and resolution. Uh, you need to identify problems, but don't try to solve them. And of course, take ready notes. And then after the review, uh, you would have to review the review process itself. So this is the main process of um, uh, review analysis or review uh, process in general that will guarantee that we can validate the set of requirements. This is for the review. How about an inspection? During the inspection, there are a couple of things that you should avoid. The first one is um, uh, uh, the devil's advocates. So, because they are contradicting for the sake of the argument, uh, the second one is debugging. Try to find problems that don't try to fix them because you don't have, time, don't have time to do this. Reviewing the authors and not the product. Don't focus on reviewing the author. Try to focus on reviewing the product because you like to validate it. Also, uh, don't try to get engaged in debates and uh, discussions. Just try to record issues for later discussion. Um, don't violate rules and deviate from the agenda of the review. Have people put, say, like a dollar into the party fund when they speak out of turn. That might be another silly way to put them um, within the agenda. Take away the chairs, stand up review, which sometimes you might want to do this. So, uh, so uh, not to uh, deviate from the agenda of um, the inspection within the review. Timer to try to put a timer to limit participants from talking longer than allowed. That's a part of um, the um, agenda um, 
justification uh, in the full inspection process. As I said before, we talked about the Vagan inspection process, which is considered as a structural review process um, that aim in finding defects in development documents, including requirement specifications. They actually named after Michael Beckham, who is credited with being the inventor of formal software inspection. This was in IBM in 70s. Every activity um, in Vagan inspection uh, is considered that uh, it has entry and exit criteria which might be more or less like pre and post uh, conditions. The VACAN inspection process, which is our structural review process, it actually offers a way to validate whether the output combines with the exit criteria intended for that activity or not. So the main activities that we might see it in the VACAN inspection process to validate the requirements, including the planning and then overview and then preparation meetings, and then rework, and finally follow up. Planning, materials are prepared. Scheduling is completed. Overview, try to communicate and educate about the product. Also, circulate materials and assign roles. Third step, preparation. All participants review product individually, and then review materials would be done to detect defects. During the inspection, a reader, um, a reader would actually um, we we'll try to paraphrase the design and identify and note problems. Again, don't try to solve them. Rework again such that all the problems and errors would be addressed by the author. Immediately document. Follow up, a modulator would be selected to ensure that all errors have been corrected. If we do have more than 5% reworked, then the product is inspected by original inspection team. That's um, too much uh, of rework to be done. So um, in summarization for validation, we talked about scenarios, we talked about storyboards, we talked about reviews, and we talked about inspection. All of these are ways to validate the requirements. So to summarize the inspection in particular, we, uh, we know that inspection is very effective, especially if we do the inspection on um, for code, the code and inspection um, uh, is very important than testing for finding defects. If we are doing an inspection for a specification like uh, requirement specification, an inspection is all we have because you cannot test a specification. The key idea behind an inspection is that during the preparation, reviewers would inspect individually uh, first. Everyone would do the inspection individually. The collection um, meeting afterwards in which reviewers would meet to merge their defects list and then a log, um, they will log each defect, like you try to, um, to prepare a defect list, a compiled de uh, defect list, such that you have this uh, list identified during the validation process using the review and then inspection processes. And don't try to fix them, just list them. The meeting place as an important rule because reviewers would learn from one another when they compare their list. And in addition to this, Additional defects could maybe uncovered. Try to um, uh, to uh, to keep track of those uh, profiles uh, that will be retrieved from the inspection because they are important for the process improvement. Keep in mind there are wide choice of inspection techniques in which we need to identify what rules to use in the meeting, how to structure the meeting, what kind of checklist to use. So this is the end of the validation component. To start the verification component, I just need to, to emphasize on the model analysis. Model analysis is done on the validation and on the verification. Because next I will talk about the verification, then I'll start saying that the model analysis in the verification is, uh, is all about uh, answering the question, is the model well formed or not? Are the parts of the model consistent with one another or not? Are the related models of different types uh, are consistent or not? Keep in mind in verification, we are trying to answer the question, are we building the model right or not? For model analysis in validation, we, uh, we might see, um, as we have seen before actually, 
some kind of animation could be used of the model, and especially in small examples. We might do some formal challenges. We might answer what if questions, and even we might do state exploration. That's part in model checking to find traces that satisfy some properties. Okay, so I will go next over the verification. I need to, um, to um, explain for you that uh, in verification, we need to check if a representation and our requirement engineering process, we're gonna focus on the SRS uh, in particular. Is it consistent with itself or not? Also, we need to check whether the system that was developed would meet the specification and dependent on how valid the specification are. So this is a part from the validation. Uh, different methods that can be used to verify uh, the specification, including inspection, which is similar to what we discussed in the validation process. Traceability, so we talked about traceability matrix before. Traceability matrix is very important to verify requirements uh, and to verify the specification document in total. Also, we could use formal verification like model checking, which can also be seen as um, a validation effort. In addition to the formal verification, traceability, and inspection, we might use testing and code and inspection. So among all of these methods, we might even have some uh, formal analysis of methods, including logic models as the first order logic, which can use theorem proving. It's a little bit expensive and it's very slow. Or we could use workflow uh, and state machine models uh, um, similarly, like simulation and reachability analysis, simulation is considered as high level prototype implementation in which partial analysis on certain number of test cases is conducted. While reachability analysis, it determines all reachable states in a workflow or even a state machine model. Specifically for workflows, the formal um, uh, battery net notation is used. Sometimes we might use the data flow diagram notations. Different types of consistency check also might be used for formal analysis of the models, including requirement uh, between uh, two models. One of them could be considered abstract and one of them could be considered a concrete model. Uh, it is um, uh, uh, commonly used because we can trace, we can observe to find equivalence among all um, the requirements uh, in the specification this add to the formal analysis of different models during the verification process. So um, in addition to the logic modeling and workflow um, and state machine modeling, or um, even some other type of consistency check that we could do it to verify the specification document, we can even do model checking. Model checking could be used for behavior workflow and state machine models. It uses the approach of reachability analysis, some typical properties to be verified for a given model, including general properties and specific properties. General properties, it includes absence of the deadlock in system with concurrency as an example, and also all states can be reached and all the transitions can be traversed. Why for specific the properties? They mainly depend on particular system because they are specific. They must be specific using suitable notations. Commonly used notations are the logic assertions or invariance of that. Temporal logic, uh, including um, the logic extension with two operators, like the logic operations, in which we can capture and maintain goals, capture or even avoid and maintain goals. And eventually, we might even achieve the desired goals. So aside from the formal analysis of methods, we could even use an inspection methods for verification. This uh, could be classified to four um, uh, to three different categories. Either we do a basic um, um, semantic check, like synthetic or semantic check, uh, in which we're going to inspect UML diagrams by answering or finding answers to um, our classes represented with rectangles, not circles. That's part of the verification. This is called semantic check. Are they connected with association and specialization links or not? Are they really classes or something else? That's a big question to be answered. So we need to do semantic or, se or like synthetic check on our uh, models. 
Uh, another way we could do it is by use cross check among all of the grams to, uh, to check on the consistency, if it's, uh, if it's uh, achieved or not, because it's extremely important. Basic checks on the um, consistency would include uh, uh, identifying if classes of object in system in a sequence diagram would appear in the class diagram or not. Are actors in the SSDs appear in a use case diagram or not? Uh, like each sequ system sequence diagram would describe a use case in the use case diagram or not. Keep in mind all of these diagramic models should be in the SRS at the end. So they should be consistent. Also each actor in an activity diagram that uses the system must also be seen in the use case diagram. Otherwise, there will be inconsistency, and that's part of the replication of uh, results that would be conducted when you verify your um, entire specification document. Each activity in the activity diagram that involves use of the system must actually associate with one or more use cases in the use case diagram. The state diagrams uh, must reflect the state of one or more object from the class diagram, and finally, the use cases that are seen in the use case diagram uh, should be seen if and only if they appear in the SRS. So how would you, in um, a, third a third step uh, in inspecting those models using um, the non-functional requirement inspection, you could do this using taxonomies because they help to ensure coverage of various relevant non-functional requirement type and their relationships. The above can be used to enrich the inspection checklist, including check consistency, uh, check which, which can be calculated by check the connection among all diagrams, the cross connection between all the diagrams, and the systematic check over the diagrams themselves. So if we're gonna focus, like I'm gonna say, let's take an example, um, especially for DVD diagram, how would you do sample checklist for DVD diagram that will be used for an inspection later? You need to, uh, to ensure that the documentation contains the date, number of pages, list of topics, a change, and even virtual control. Also, the process should be represented by a number circle or even a rounded rectangle. That's part of the verification. Identifier should begin with a verb, and the maximum number of precises should, not, should be like um, seven plus or minus two. There are no black holes, no miracles, no miracles and the models must be balanced. So uh, another example to do a cross check for UMLs, let's do it over different type of diagrams, not necessarily for the DFDs. For the use case diagram, does each use case have a user? If, if, if we can't find a user within each use case, that's, uh, that's a checklist error that should be listed in such a checklist and then it could be handed later. Is each use case documented? This could be done using sequence diagram or even equivalent. That's part in the use case verification. For class diagrams, does the class diagram capture all the classes and entities mentioned in other diagram? Does every class have methods to get and set its attribute? That's, that's a big question need to be answered as well, especially when we deal with class diagrams. For sequence diagrams, is each class in the sequence diagram is presented or not? Can each message be sent or some, there are some messages that have been uh, associated from a sender but not actually being received. Is there is a, a method call in the sending class for each send message or not? Is there a method um, call in the receiving class for each receive method or not? This is this all verification purposes that should be uh, performed. If we're gonna do um, the cross check for the state chart diagram as part of the UML diagramming, part of the identification that you need to answer, does each state chart diagram capture a single class? Is that class in the class diagram or is not? Does each transition have a trigger event? Does each state represent a distinct combination of attribute values or not? Are there method calls in the class diagram for each transition? These are very important questions that we need to verify against the state um, chart diagram. So aside from the formal inspection or the checklist um, and, and even the formal analysis of, middle, of models, an important tool or, or approach that could be used for verification 
is uh, the traceability. And as a matter of fact, traceability is good in verification and it's also important at some component in the validation process. According to the IEEE standards 830, we have two types of traceability. The first one is the backward traceability and the second one is the forward traceability. If you remember, we said backward traceability in which we traces uh, the origin of each requirement while in the forward traceability, we are tracing the requirement to all the artifacts that fall, would follow the SRS, including the design and the implementation. We say a specification is traceable if it contains or implements all applicable uh, stipulations in a predecessor document um, in which a given term, acronym, um, acronym or abbreviation, uh, which might lead to the same thing in all documents, this should be implemented. A given item or concept is referred to by the same name in the document. Also, all materials in the successor document has its basis in the preceding document, and we cannot see any untraceable materials uh, should uh, be appear or introduced. Uh, the two documentations should not be contradicting with each other. This is part of tracing the, the specification. One version of the specification is done is, trace, is traceable first, and then another one is, um, is, that, is, is provided after we refine our requirements, especially if we do have requirement changes. So um, if you recall requirement traceability, it is considered as part of the requirement management. Um, in which checks can be done using traceability techniques or traceability me uh, methods, in which given the requirement document, just verify that all elicitation notes are covered, in which all the source of requirements are actually documented. Tracing between different level of requirements in which we check goals against tasks, features, requirements. The traceability, requirement traceability would involve the development of either traceability table or traceability list or traceability matrix uh, in which we ensure uh, that we should ensure that requirements have been taken into consideration. Uh, also, we should ensure that everything in the specification is just justified. This is part of the traceability in which we trace, we start the traceability from the problem is happening going to the requirement elicitation and analysis, and then for moving forward to the specification and finally to the design. There are two different types of traceability, vertical traceability or horizontal traceability. For vertical traceability, we capture relationship across different type of artifacts and horizontal traceability, a relationship between artifacts of the same type. This is the difference between vertical and uh, horizontal traceability. More on traceability, there are um, um, few information that we should consider pre-traceability and even post-traceability. Post Before adding to the requirement documents, where does it come from? Who, shall, who suggested and why? These are the pre-traceability um, um, procedure that you should perform. And post-traceability, after you, after you build the traceability metrics, you should uh, keep track of any additional information should, uh, that should be added to the SRS, especially when it comes to answer the question related how it is actually implemented. Traceability is really good because it helps link requirements and design implementation artifacts. As we said before, there are two different categories, it could, different type, or different ways. It could be uh, backward traceability, forward traceability. And for backward traceability, we find rationale for having design implementation artifact related to the why question why for the forward traceability, we see how requirements are implemented, what design implementation artifacts are affected. This is bought through the how question. In addition to these two types of disability and the two procedures uh, that uh, you should do before and after traceability, there are two major um, um, classes of traceability uh, in which we identified on the level of being explicit traceability or implicit traceability. In explicit traceability, uh, you would link elements. Uh, otherwise, um, uh, those elements are not actually inherently linked. Uh, and then you would develop, create relationships from external considerations. Specifically, those links that are implemented and are actually cleared. While implicit um, um, traceability, 
they would inherit, uh, be inherited in the nature of the artifact. Um, they are not explicitly represented and um, it's, uh, it's not clearly seen. Um, they cannot be specifically provided, just like inherit in the nature of the artifact. Artifact could be a design, it could be an implementation or a code. In addition to explicit and implicit traceability, we might even have internal and external uh, traceability. Internal and external, uh, for internal traceability, the relationship between the artifacts of the same type, while external traceability, the relationship between uh, artifacts of different types. So for example, if you are comparing scenarios, we could have other version of the same scenario, but for External traceability, if you compare scenarios and class diagrams, this is external traceability. If you compare requirements and code, this is external traceability. The big question is, why do we need traceability? So as it is widely used in the validation and verification of the entire requirement engineering process, it helps in managing changes because the changes in requirements during the development process are natural. So um, one of the reasons to use traceability, it helps in managing the requirements in which the, the requirement changes, in which the requirement change may impact the design, implementation, testing, and other artifacts. Also, it's really good because it explores how lower level changes would affect the requirements. This is, could be done on a bottom up level. Also, traceability is really important because it can be easily used in quality assurance. To back up those uh, reasons, we can say that for verification, traceability is good to prepare this uh, suit. It helps in assessing the uh, conformance uh, to requirements. Also, it helps in assessing completeness, consistency, and even performing impact analysis. Traceability is important because you can easily check the consistency of the decision making across the entire life cycle. Traceability is important not only on the verification level, but also on the maintenance level because it, uh, it is crucial in assessing and implementing the changes to request. Also, it helps in tracing the design rationale. In addition to the verification and the maintenance levels, we could even use traceability on the document access level to provide an ability to find information quickly in larger amount of material. For traceability purposes, we, we know that it is widely used also in process visibility in which we have the ability to infer how the software was developed. Finally, we see traceability on the management level in which we control the, ma uh, the change and we provide risk management and project and development control. So traceability is important due to the briefest reasons. And in addition to this, it prevents losing, no losing knowledge. It supports the verification process and it helps in the impact analysis, especially it is important for change control and even process monitoring. It uh, improves the software quality and it, really, it is widely used in re-engineering and even reuse. For the reuse, it helps by identif identifying what goes with the requirement, even in the design and, uh, phase and the code phase. Another important reason of using traceability is risk reduction. But with those benefits of using traceability, here come some issues. Traceability is expensive because it requires tool support, sometimes supported by application lifecycle management tool, which add another cost to it. Also, um, the motivation, somehow the enablers of traceability are not its beneficiaries. Um, uh, benefits comes later in the life cycle anyway. So until you wait for this, you might need a great motivation to start tracing um, uh, requirements. Also uh, elements to be traced are very diverse and a very large quantity. So this may, may increase the complexity of the size and the diversity of the problem. And no common schema for classifying and cate uh, categorizing uh, them. So because there is no specific scheme to classify different traceability module or different traceability uh, types. So it really, it might not, it might be vague in terms of the size and the diversity. Also, it must be done throughout the development and the maintenance effort, which can constantly, um, constantly maintain traceability links. And at this point, it cannot be stopped. 
because as soon as the lengths are outdated, the volume will actually shrink down. So finally, there are um, independent. The validation and the verification could be done side by side, or they could be done completely independent. The verification and validation, they are performed by a separate contractor. So I could hire a contractor to do validation for the entire specification, or I can, do, uh, can hire another contractor to do uh, uh, the entire um, validation. They are independent um, um, in a way that um, they might be uh, good to fulfill the need for an independent technical CEO opinion. The cost could range between 5% and 15% of the development cost. Some studies shows up to five-fold return on investment. Um, they are very good because uh, areas, uh, errors once found earlier, they would be cheaper to fix and cheaper to retest. It helps in providing clear specifications and also developers more likely to use the best practice out of the results of the verification and validation. When we say they are independent, um, there are three types of independency. It could be managerial independence or finance independence or technical independence. For ma uh, managerial independence, um, at this point, we separate responsibility uh, from that of the developing uh, of developing the software. While financial independence, um, the cost and the fund will be assigned separately for each contractor. No risk of diverting resources while the ongoing um, will like actually get through. And finally, technical independence. Um, keep in mind that we have different personnel to avoid some bias. Also, we will use different tools and different techniques. In summarization for this class, we talked about validation, we talked about verification, and we talked about different approaches to uh, provide validation and verification. In validation, we, we focus on a checking if we are solving the right problem. This could be done using prototyping in which we get customer feedback very early or by an inspection in which domain experts will read the specification carefully or informal analysis, which is considered as a mathematical analysis of your model. In addition to this, we could add some meetings and regular communication with the stakeholders and of course, reviews. On the verification, we need to check um, your engineering stack are sound or not. Are you building this product in the right way or not? In which we're gonna do consistency check and traceability. For the traceability, you need to be sure that the design code test cases would actually reflect the requirements in the specification document or not. For the usage of the verification and validation, you need to use them in an appropriate way, such that early customer feedback is appreciated if your models are just checks, sketches. Analysis and consistency checking if your models are specifications. And independence, uh, important, uh, if your system is actually safety uh, critical. These are different ways to achieve a proper, uh, an appropriate usage of the verification and validation. So with this, I'm ending today's class and thank you for listening and I'll see you next week.